the latest update to Adobe Character Animator CC adds several new features to help bring your Photoshop and Illustrator creations to life. Collidable particles allow you to easily create simulations like rain falling on an umbrella or objects being blasted out of a cannon. Playing around with parameters like gravity, velocity, and particles per second can lead to dramatically different results. Several new example puppets have been added to the Start workspace, providing new template characters like a clay-sculpted scientist with head turns or a mysterious hand-illustrated wizard. The new Scene Snapshot tool lets you set a transparent overlay of your puppet state at any time, giving you more visual guidance when recording between poses, and a new countdown timer makes it easier to prepare for recording a performance. Hold takes let you freeze any position in a recorded performance, making it easier to pinpoint key moments to hold and transition between character poses. Behaviors and takes can now be shared between puppets by simply copying and pasting them, making it now possible to get rigging or recording information from one character to another. And the keyboard shortcut editor lets you see existing shortcuts, as well as the ability to add your own custom key combinations for more efficient workflows. Dragging groups into the Triggers panel now reveals drop zones for making a simple trigger, like showing or hiding static artwork or an animated sequence, or a swap set, like choosing between several different hand positions. Clicking a layer listed in the trigger now reveals it in the Puppet panel, and clicking the Triggers icon in the Puppet panel highlights its corresponding trigger. Triggers show up as orange if they're empty or have a conflict inside a swap set, making it easier to identify potential issues and triggers can also now be copied and pasted between different puppets. Recorded triggers are easier to move and edit. Just drag any trigger or swap set recording bar to move it to a different time, or drag the edges to shorten or lengthen the trigger. And a new option to hide trigger and visim take bars gives you a cleaner view of your performances. You can customize the look of your controls panel buttons by simply dragging any layer onto any button letting you create clear and functional control systems that are retained when you share your puppets with other people. And parameter sliders and dials now have arming buttons for easy access when you're ready to record with them. All right, so yes, Character Animator 1.5 is out right now. Uh, you can go download it, check out all these new features, and that was just a kind of a brief overview looking at a very high level of some of the newest uh, and coolest stuff that's been added. But now we're going to do more of a deep dive into these features and how you can use them uh, in your own characters. So the first thing, um, we've done a little bit of a UI refresh, so you'll notice um, the fonts look a little bit cleaner, things are a little more spaced out, and it looks a little more similar to what you might expect in Premiere Pro or After Effects. Um, and that's because we've done a basic uh, UI refresh on a lot of this stuff. The icons, the fonts, everything should look a little crisper and cleaner and hopefully more modern and a little bit easier to use overall. Um, one of the other things you'll notice, like this wizard guy, is that we have a lot of new characters in the start panel. So when you first start off here, um, we've always had Blank Face and Chloe, but Dr. Applesmith is now uh, a free example puppet. He's a clay animated style character that you can uh, fool around with, and he's got some head turn animations associated with him. And then if you click this little um, arrow icon uh, over here, you'll be able to see the rest of the new characters. And that includes Bongo the Gorilla, who we've, we've always had for a while um, as a free downloadable character, but we wanted to show him here as a really good example of the Nutcracker jaw um, and he's just got a great style to him as well as that bearded wizard character um, which is a fantastic handcrafted uh, hand-drawn character with some awesome cycle layers lip sync to look into as well as the chicken blaster which is a uh, example of physics and uh, collidable particles so that Chicken Blaster example project uh, is a really good starting place because it shows off the new feature Collidable Particles. Um, and so when I uh, am in this project and I hold down the left mouse button, chickens will start flying out of this cannon on the left and bonk into these crates. And it is necessary. Anytime you open this project, you have to hit all the boxes down. You just have to. Uh, it, it's something you've got to do and try. And so it's kind of like a game. It's a fun a little thing. And the nice thing is down here, you've, oh, I've almost got this boxes. Come on. There we go. 
I, I should do a Twitch stream of uh, me hitting Chicken Blaster. Anyway, um, it's fun to fool around with this and get a general idea of what's going on. And then in addition, if you use the controls panel down here, you've got a lot of options for ways to uh, change the settings uh, of uh, what's happening here. So if I refresh this scene, and then let's change the gravity strength down to zero. So we have zero gravity. Let's change uh, particles per second up about, about halfway there. And let's change the velocity to be a little faster. Now. I've kind of got a rapid fire chicken blaster and things just start floating in the air as if there was uh, you know, zero gravity. And uh, it's, it's pretty fun to be able to manipulate these things. Okay, so how did this happen? How can you make fl floating chickens or snow effects or rain effects or that sort of stuff with collidable particles? Let's dig into the chicken blaster here by double clicking it in the timeline. Okay, so inside rig mode, if I click the chicken group here, which is an independent group, I can see that a behavior has been added to it. And this is a nice new feature as well. When you click over the behaviors, um, column, you get a nice little plus icon there. So if you clicked that, you have the ability to add a behavior directly from here, which is a nice little just uh, ease of use feature. But anyway, um, if I go over here, I can see listed particles uh, shows up as the behavior that's been added to this chicken. And sure enough, if I scroll down here on the right, I can see particles was, was added to it. Now, the biggest thing to note here is that if you want particles to collide with other objects in the scene, you need to just check collide down here. You don't tag it as collide or dynamic or draggable as you do with other things like the boxes here. If I select one of these boxes and go here, I can see that it's been tagged as collide and dynamic. But for particles, because there's so many particles happening, um, the way that you do it is through the simulation itself. And that is by just checking collide down here. Now the reason this guy shoots out um, with the left click is because I've set this to point and shoot mode. And there's other options here, snow and cannon. Uh, I'll show the snow example actually through um, this other character, Umbrella Jones. So what you can see here is that this rain is falling down and it's hitting the umbrella and it's colliding with it. And this is an example of the snow uh, mode for uh, particles. And the umbrella has been set to collide. So when the rain uh, touches it and bounces off of it, um, it will react to it and, and have it that as a collision object. And here you can see uh, just at the top here, I've got these two little independent groups um, that look like little rice kernels. And each of these has a particles behavior added to it with the particle mode set to snow. Now I did a few different things here. I did you know some of the velocity. Spread basically determines um, how much of the scene it's gonna take up. So where is that rain falling from? Is it just happening from one location right in the middle right there? Or is it spread out through the entire scene? Um, and then of course you definitely want collide checked. And because the, uh, I have that, if I have Umbrella Jones um, selected here, I can see that he has also been selected or uh, tagged as collide. So he will react to those different things. Now particles and everything are subject to the laws of gravity. So um, here on the main character, if I look under my physics behavior, I can see the general things of you know the wind direction, wind strength, and I think I had them set to zero here, but I believe in the scene, if I go back to that, that yeah, I added some wind variation, some wind strength, and that's the reason they're kind of going diagonally and having that effect um, to them. And then you, know, you can change the bounciness, um, all these different factors, and those will apply globally to whatever particles, uh, whatever simulation uh, you have there. So um, just a few ways to add a little bit of extra life into your scene. So if you want rain or snow or um, things blasting out and you know smashing into boxes or crates or something like that, um, this new particle system allows you to do that a little bit more easily. The new scene snapshot feature is a great way to give yourself a reference point for a key pose. Basically, it allows you to make a ghosted or onion skin style image to use as a reference point. I'll show you what I mean. I mean. So I've got Martin here um, in a recorded performance. He's strumming back and forth. But you'll notice, you know, when I let go, it always goes back to this live view of recording. Now I can easily turn that off by disarming the character. But um, if I want to record a performance, as soon as I'm ready to record and I say, okay, let's get ready to record. I love this pose. I want to start from here. All right, I'm ready. And, and then it immediately goes back to the live image. And I have no idea, you know, where was my head again? Where was my arm at that particular position? So the way you can solve this and, and have a more accurate result is through scene snapshots. So I'm going to disarm Martin here. Let's say this is the key pose I want. That's a great pose right there. And I'm going to go to scene, take snapshot. It's shift F6 as the, uh, as the shortcut. 
And what happens there, as you'll see, is I have a ghosted image of that moment in time. Uh, and so I can change you know, the opacity of that. If I want it to be a little bit more um, apparent, I can bring up the opacity or I can bring it back down by decrease opacity. And then I can use this now as a reference point. So let's say this is the moment in time I really wanted to work off of. As soon as I press record and uh, arm that for recording, now I have that as a reference point. And when I press record, I'll be able to start from that general position and move forward. So um, there's a few different uses for this. Uh, it's great for a post to post style workflow where you have a reference pose, you record maybe for just a few frames, then you move over to the next one, record, use that, at, take a snapshot, um, and you keep on moving back and referencing a, one pose to the next. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to use this. Uh, it's a handy little tool. And if you wanna get rid of the snapshot, all you have to do is press F6 or go to scene, hide snapshot, and that will go back to normal. And when you record, uh, you've probably noticed you have this nice little recording countdown timer. Uh, we've noticed, you know, in the past, you press record and immediately you got to go and get ready for performing. But what we heard as a uh, feature that countless users have asked for is some sort of way to prepare for a performance. So now the default is when you press record, you get this nice little countdown timer and beep that happens and then it starts recording. Um, and so it basically gives you three seconds to get ready and do your performance. Uh, if you don't like this though, you do have the option to go to timeline, countdown before recording, turn that off and it will go back to the old way um, for immediate recording as soon as you press the record button. But Ever since I've had it on, uh, in internal builds here, uh, I've left it on and it's been great. Um, so I don't think too many of you will be turning that off. Another feature that's really helpful for editing recorded performances is the new hold take feature. So um, I've got this performance of Dr. Applesmith, you know, complaining about something, moving his arm around. And there's this one part where he turns his head really briefly uh, with the head turner. and. Uh, it kind of looks like a mistake. It happens so fast that I want to basically just keep him moving forward. So I could do a few things. I could delete that head turn performance. I could record another performance and blend it over top. But another way to deal with it would be adding a hold take. So I'm going to select the take that I want to basically freeze frame, which in this case is the head turner. Um, I'm going to select that and then I'm going to go up to timeline, new hold take. And look what that does. That has extracted uh, for, I believe, a second uh, by default that, uh, that one frame or that one part of that take and extended it as uh, held in that position. And so what I can do now is keep that and drag that out. Um, so that's going to keep the head turner position in that frozen in that state that it was extracted from the timeline. So now when I drag over, I should only see the head turner stuck in that one position and then when I go back, it's going to look seamless and look fine. And you do have blend handles for blended performances where you want to hold a head position or a dragger or something like that. Um, you can extract it and do this. So basically, it, I found it most useful in fixing mistakes when something flutters or moves too much or something like that. I can bring out a whole take, hold a position. Um, it works great also for a po pose to pose workflow um, where you are, you know, keeping one pose, moving to the next, doing that. You can just do hold takes, just do, um, you know, hold one take, hold another take, blend them into each other, and it looks pretty good. This release has a lot more flexibility in things you can copy and paste and basically share between puppets and scenes. So one of those is behaviors. So I've got my character, Suzanne. She's got 10 behaviors associated with her here. I'm going to remove them all, actually, by going to Puppet, Remove All Behaviors, and that's going to remove her, uh, everything from her. Now, if I go to a different puppet, like let's say Evans here, another robot, then let's say he's got a particular set of behaviors that includes nutcracker jaw or breathing or something like that that I want to share with this other puppet. So what I can do is select that or any group that has a behavior or behaviors associated with it and then go to edit copy behaviors. And now if I go back to my original puppet and go to edit paste, that is going to paste those behaviors and share those with that puppet. So if you have a lot of dragger behaviors or special things that you're adding to a character and you want to easily share that between other puppets, uh, this is the way to do it. Now, another thing you can share are uh, your triggers. So here I've got a bunch of triggers for uh, Evans. And let's say I like this general structure. This is something that I want to use for another character. So I can select these all by pressing Command A on Mac, or that's Control A on Windows. And then I'm going to copy them. Of course, there's shortcuts for all of these, but you can do it this way. And then I'm going to go back to Suzanne. And I'm going to make sure the triggers panel is selected here. And then I'm going to go to Edit Paste 
and all those triggers get pasted in. But of course, you can immediately see all these triggers are orange. Now, why is that? Well, in this latest release, we make things orange when there is something wrong with it, when there is either a conflict within a swap set or the trigger is empty. So, you know, by default, when you paste triggers from one to the other, it's not gonna be able to know where all the corresponding groups or layers are. And that probably makes sense because, you know, no two characters are probably gonna be structured the same. They're gonna have a lot of differences and variations, but it's really easy to fill this in. So, um, you know, if I want the eyes to be part of this, I can just drag the eye over top of, you know, this trigger and immediately it goes back to the, uh, the gray state. Same thing with down here, let's go to this. And I can just slowly drag and drop things to fill in the blanks and continue to add the layers and groups that are behind the triggers. Now, one other instance where orange uh, text will show up in the triggers panel is when a swap set has a conflict. So within a swap set, these all, you only want one of these to show up at a time. And so if you made both of these uh, triggered by the five key, well, that means they're both competing for your attention because it, uh, the character animator only wants to show one of these at a time, but if they're both assigned to five, then it's like, well, which one am I using? So this is just a helpful way, um, just it kind of informs you when things are going wrong. And actually, if you do that, uh, if you hover over, if anything's orange and you hover over it, it will tell you exactly what is wrong with it so you can fi figure out how to fix it. The last area that you guys have been asking for a lot for copy and paste ability are takes. So you can uh, copy and paste performances from one character to the next. If I've got this character, you know, with, I like their eye gaze, I like their head movement, I like the lip sync, um, nutcracker jaw, all of that stuff, I have the ability to select these and I'm just gonna copy them. Uh, I can go to edit copy and then go to another scene. And so for her, I can just go to edit paste and that is going to paste that performance, those takes here. And so I can go through it, scrub through it, and I can see the head moving, the eyes moving, uh, the lip sync, all of that stuff associated with the previous recording and previous puppet um, now added into this puppet. So this is a great time saver, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a large cast of characters and you wanna share a lot of similar rest poses or performances or head movements, um, this is the way to do it now. Now here's another way to go about this. Uh, you can actually replace a character, a puppet that has recorded something in the timeline with a completely different puppet. Uh, so here I've got Suzanne and she's got a bunch of, you know, recorded data here of moving her head back and forth and talking. Uh, but what I can do is with her selected, I can go up to select any puppet up here, let's say Martin, for example, right click her here in the timeline and do replace with selected puppet in project panel. And if I do that, it's going to bring in, swap in this new puppet, but that recorded data is still there. All the head movements, the lip sync, the eye gaze, all that stuff's going to show up. And it's also gonna inherit like her scale and positioning so I can you know, readjust those as need be. So this is great. You are not stuck to one character for a performance. If you recorded something and then you want a different character to say those lines or you completely change the model and it's a totally different puppet, now it's easier than ever to just swap a new character in and inherit most of that recorded data. If you're like me and there are certain actions that you are doing constantly and you wish there was a way to add some sort of shortcut to it, you're in luck because now if you go to edit keyboard shortcuts, you have the ability to not only see existing shortcuts, but add new keyboard shortcuts. So let's go down here and you know something like timeline and I can see you know to add a marker or add stop marker. So this is a great reference tool to kind of go through and familiarize yourself with all the existing shortcuts. But then if there's things you do a lot, like blend take in and out, I'm always doing this. I'm adding uh, blend handles and kind of going in and out um, of a particular take. And so what I could do is hold down the keys that I want uh, to integrate with this, uh, to be connected to this, and then drag them over it. So I'm gonna press, um, let's say Shift B for this. So I'm gonna press Shift and B, and then I'm just gonna drag this down into Blend Take In and Out, and now it's been added. So now when I select a take and press that, it's gonna automatic automatically add those uh, blend handles. So my advice is spend some time going through this list, checking things out, and there are a lot of things that do not have uh, shortcuts associated with them. And so if you see things that you feel like you've got a good shortcut idea, go ahead and add it in here. And it's just gonna make your workflow just a little bit faster, but as you all know, you know those seconds add up uh, over time and you'll save yourself a lot of time in the long run.
almost any puppet you make is going to have triggers associated with it. And uh, in the last release, you know, we completely revamped the trigger system, gave it its own panel down here, but we've refined that system even more based off of your feedback and having a little bit of extra time to think about some of the most common workflows. So one of those is when you drag a group into the triggers panel, sometimes you want it to be a simple trigger, but sometimes you want it to be a swap set. And what we found is people would drag a group in here and get one thing or the other and sometimes it was what they wanted and sometimes it wasn't. So what we've done is given you drop zones when you drag a group in. So what I mean by this is, for example, poof. This is an animation here, a cycle layers animation of this hello uh, word bubble that pops up. This, I don't want to be a swap set. I don't want these different frames to be independent things. I want them to be just part of this sequence. So when I drag poof in, look what's happening. At the bottom, I've got a drop zone thing for create trigger or create swap set. So it's very easy now to determine what you want. And so for me, I'm gonna do this as a, just a simple trigger, and then I can assign you know the P key to that for poof, and it just works. Now for something else like a hand, where I definitely wanna swap hand positions in and out, if I dr uh, drag this hand in, change that to swap set, then it's going to do the group and its contents as different parts of the swap set. So it just gives you a little bit more information and clarity on what you're building. Now, another nice thing that we've added is a lot of times you go into these swap sets and you're like, okay, here's the layer that's associated with it, but where was that again in my puppet structure? So now if you click on any layer down here, um, it's going to select that layer or group in the puppet panel. So I can go here and go to half, and this has a bunch of stuff because it's an eye. Um, oh, this is another nice feature. You can now drag this up so you can see everything if you're like me and have you know 20 things associated with a particular trigger. And if I click on this, it's going to even um, you know twirl open any uh, hidden groups or anything that's twirled up and show you uh, where that that trigger is and so um, or where that layer is I should say associated with the trigger. Now, very similarly, if you click on uh, in the puppet panel here, if you click on the triggers icon that is going to select the associated trigger um, with any layer or group up here. And so it's easy to say, oh yeah, where did I put this in? You know, what, what trigger was this associated with? And you just click this and it's easy to see that. And sometimes a group or layer might have multiple triggers associated with it. In that case, you'll get this little arrow icon showing up next to the, uh, the little finger trigger icon. And if you click on that, it will allow you to see the different triggers that are associated. So there's three right here. Um, and I can just click on the one that I want to look for and it will highlight it in the uh, triggers panel as well. So it's just a little bit easier to kind of work between the puppet panel and the triggers panel. In the previous version, if you tried to edit triggers in the timeline, you may have felt like this guy is currently looking a little bit frustrated because uh, triggers were treated the same way as visims. So with a visim, you don't actually select the visim in the timeline, you're just selecting the in and the out points. And that allows you to make it a little bit shorter or longer at any time. If you held down shift, you can uh, select both the in and the out point at the same time and be able to drag it around. But what it sounded like you guys wanted and what makes the most sense for triggers is you want to be able to select them by default. You wanna be able to move them and keep the same timing, but move them earlier or later. And so now you can do that. You just select it uh, by clicking the, the trigger and you can move it to whatever part you want. Now you still have the ability to you know, do the in or the out point uh, as well, but uh, it's, it's just an easier way to deal with triggers. And if you're like me and you've got a really vertical timeline sometimes, you've got so many triggers, so many recordings that it starts to feel a little overwhelming. One trick that might help clean things up a little bit is by going to timeline and unchecking show trigger and visim take bars. And this is not the default, but if you do this, those parent take bars that show up above the triggers will disappear and now you are just focused on your triggers. Now if you have a lot of things that overlap each other and shadow uh, one another, it can get a little confusing and weird and that's why it's not the default right now. Um, we're working on some things for future releases that we hope to make this better with, but for now, this is a nice kind of shortcut and band-aid to a common problem that you might be running into. The controls panel has turned into my preferred way to trigger characters, uh, whether recorded or live. So, you know, you've got this nice little visual panel down here that changes the expressions of the character. Um, it gives them different eyelids or mouth shapes or animations, uh, all of that stuff. The problem is, 
uh, that by default, it's looking for whatever artwork is visible at the time. And a lot of times you run into cases like this where I don't know these first three triggers apparently didn't have anything on them, so they're just blank. Uh, there's these shadows for hands. I have no idea what's happening. Um, so we have added a way to make this really easy to customize. So let's double click on Almost All here to go to a uh, rig mode. So by default in rig mode, you don't have the controls panel show up. So I'm gonna add it manually by going to window controls and that's gonna add it down at the bottom here. And then it's as simple as selecting a layer or group and dragging it into that thumbnail. And there you go. Any group or layer can just be dragged into the thumbnail. So grit, uh, I'm gonna do that into this button and that's gonna represent that. And then let's do this wide mouth. I'm gonna select this two and drag it down here and there you go. Now these arms, this is like the shadow, I have no idea what's going on here, so instead, I'm going to go to, let's see, point, and maybe I'm only select one of the frames of this cycle layers animation and drag that in, and that's a lot clearer that this is a point now, rather than this you know crazy shadowed thing that I have no idea what it means. So it makes it a lot easier, and, and this is great because remember, this is shared when you share a puppet. So when you go to file, export puppet and save the uh, share this as a puppet file which uh, has your master photoshop or illustrator artwork plus all the rigging you've added in character animator part of that rigging is all of this so it's a really great way to um, make your character really friendly and approachable um, particularly if you're making characters for clients or other people or sharing characters between a different uh, different team members this really helps a lot We've also added a few small features that just make it easier to get around things. So um, if you are in layout mode and you wanna go back to perform mode, you can always click the perform mode uh, you know, tab up here, but you can also just double click into any blank space and that will immediately go back, which just makes it a little bit easier. A lot of times you're laying things out or moving things around and really quickly wanna go back to perform. This just makes it a little bit easier to get back. Um, one other thing we've done is you'll notice any dial or uh, slider controls. So let me add another one here by going to layout mode and anything that has a dotted line over here means it can be dragged in over here to the controls panel. And anything that has uh, this little dot means it can be armed for recording. So previously, if you wanted to record your changes to these, you had to go all the way over here and find the corresponding uh, parameter that uh, matched with what was over here. This is just a shortcut and makes it a lot easier when you're recording. If I wanted to record this guy rotating or scaling or anything like that, now when this is armed, that means when I press the record button, this data is gonna be saved and recorded to a take. JPEG support has been added in this latest release, so I can import a, a new JPEG background, for example, if I wanted by going to my project panel, double clicking any blank space to get the import. Uh, let's go to mountains.jpg, uh, import that, and it appears as a puppet. Now, of course, because it's a flat JPEG, it's not gonna have, you're not gonna be able to do all your you know, groups and layers and whatnot, but it's great for background. So I can just drag this into my scene behind my wizard, and now I've got mountains in the background of my scene. So in the last version, when you tagged an independent group like this box here and wanted it to uh, have physics affected and uh, collision and all that stuff, you had to do three things. Tag it as dynamic, tag it as collide, and then change the attach style to free instead of weld, which is the default. Uh, what we found is you know, 99 times out of 100, you wanna do all three of those, and so all you have to do now is just tag it as dynamic. And that does the other two things automatically. So tagging as dynamic will automatically tag it as collide and automatically change the attach style to free, which means that's gonna be a free moving, collidable, dynamic box object. So just making life a little bit easier. As you select different things in the puppet panel, you'll notice that you get these yellow outlines around things. If they're independent at the little crown icon, that means it will just show that group. But uh, if there's a lot of different things that depend on it, like all these things, anything with a yellow line next to it means it's controlled by this kind of master Almasol uh, parent group up here, then you get this yellow outline showing all that stuff, all the hand positions, the desk, all these things that are connected to it. Um, if you wanna turn that off and you don't wanna see that, we now have an option to do that, this little uh, icon down here, show mesh outline and auto handles. And taking that off, we'll get rid of that yellow outline as well as these green um, dotted lines showing where things are connected to each other as well. So it's just kind of a cleaner view. Um, if you're not uh, deep in rigging uh, and you wanna just see the blue outline, which shows what the uh, kind of the edges of the artwork are, uh, that's one way to do it. It's just a visibility option. And we still have the show mesh option, which shows kind of where all the, uh, the breakdown of the, um, 
the triangles are, how the mesh is being created. And so, you know, if you have both these on, you might run into performance issues for larger puppets, or it might feel a little bit too overwhelming and crowded. So now you have the option to have them both on, both off, one on, one off, uh, whatever works best for you. One small change we've made, if you arm a parameter inside a behavior over here, so let's say I arm head tilt strength to something like 259, and then when I move my head, this is much more dramatic. Uh, the head is moving a lot more based off of my tilt. But because this is armed, this is considered a temporary value. And because I haven't clicked record yet, it's just considered, you know, it's, it hasn't been recorded to, to the timeline yet. And so it's temporary. So when I move the timeline around uh, to a different value, it's gonna change back to its initial default position. So if you want that position to stick, there's one of two things you could do. Number one, if you if you want it to stay as one value, just disarm it and keep this as whatever you want and that will be the default value for the head. Don't worry about arming it, just keep it as that default. Or if you wanted it to change over time, then you would move your CTI to wherever you want things to start and then arm that, change it to the value, click record, and then over time as it's recording, you could drag this to change the strength at the head tilt strength over time of the recording. And you would only do this again if you really want things to change over the course of uh, you know a few seconds or something like that. Stop, and now you can see that head tilt strength has been recorded down here, and that is basically set in stone now, and that is the default when that bar is apparent. So the bottom line is if you want this value to stick, record it or disarm it. Sometimes you see your character in the perfect position and you wanna use it as a you know, thumbnail for your video on YouTube or Facebook or same to share on social media. Um, and previously, you had to do a screen capture of this and crop everything out and it, it wasn't easy uh, to do. There was no inherent way in Character Animator to just export out a single frame. Well, luckily in this latest release, you can go to File, Export, Frame, and that will allow you to save this as a uh, ping image. And so I did that, and now you can see that shows up as its own image. So just one easier way to get a single frame out of Character Animator. We've given a lot more control to Adobe Illustrator files. So if you have an Adobe Illustrator file imported into Character Animator, like this uh, Chloe Illustrator file, and render as vector is checked, then the character's gonna look great no matter if they're 25%, 900%, um, the fidelity will still be there within Character Animator. But not everything Illustrator does is currently supported in Character Animator, so you might bring your character in and notice some things are missing or it doesn't look 100% right, and in that case, you would have to rasterize it. And before, it would be by default rasterized at 200%. So now you've got additional options if you uncheck this you now can see resolution and change it to different fidelity levels. So uh, maybe for as you're rigging or recording and performing, if you want better performance, you might uh, make it a draft uh, mode or low resolution or uh, default resolution. Or if you really want to make it as high res as possible, like I can start to see some jagged lines here on her face. If I zoom in really closely, I can go into high and that's gonna look a lot better. That's actually 400%, four times um, the resolution. And so for most cases, that's gonna be more than enough that you need. Um, so this is really only gonna apply um, when you are exporting your file. So maybe while you're performing, you might change this to draft or low to keep the performance uh, you know, in a good, good place. But before you export, change this to high and you'll make sure to have really crisp images um, when you export your video or dynamic link it to After Effects or Premiere. Finally, the last feature that we'll talk about today is non-centered pupil support. So in the past, if your character had slightly off-center eyes like this, if they weren't directly in, the pupils weren't directly in the center of the eyeballs, uh, you could run into a lot of problems of the pupils falling off the eyeballs or the eyes not following to the edges as realistically as you would want. But this has been changed in the latest release. So if I have an uh, eye set up like this, and now we're in record mode, and I've got keyboard input armed, so when I press the right arrow, uh, notice her eyes, the one that's closer to the edge is just having to move a small distance while the other one is moving a lot more to compensate for that extra room. And same if I press left. So the eyes are going all the way to the edges instead of just moving a little bit or moving too much. Uh, so now it really doesn't matter where you put your pupils, they don't have to be centered in the middle of the eyeball. It's okay if you move them around stylistically or have them a little off center. Hopefully the pupils will still move realistically um, based off your keyboard or eye movements or mouse movements, um, depending on what you have armed over here in the eye gaze behavior. 
All right, so that is it for Character Animator 1.5. Uh, it is out now. Have fun with it. Check it out. If you want a full list of all the changes that have been added in this release, uh, check out this URL. Ch changes uh, will allow you to see everything that we've uh, added. And uh, if you have questions, concerns, bug reports, issues, anything like that, the best place to get help is the official Character Animator forums on Adobe's website. That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching, and have fun.